Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to hear from Dr. Robert Higgs about one of the uh, most dangerous and pervasive uh, economic myths in the whole world, the myth of war prosperity. Dr. Higgs. You know, the, uh, the mainstream economists pre pretend that they know how to forecast. Uh, a, a lot of mainstream economists actually call themselves forecasters, and, and uh, they, they purport to know what's going to happen in the future. But, but uh, actually, the, the Mises Institute knows what's going to happen in the future. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm going to prove it to you because uh, this morning, uh, when I went to breakfast in the hotel next door, I picked up uh, USA Today, uh, not because I, I regard this as the paper of record, <clears throat> but, uh, but because it was there. And uh, I picked one up, and the, uh, the headline uh, reads, uh, $150 billion insurance policy aimed at shaky economy. And the subheadline says, Stimulus seeks to prevent recession. And uh, I'm sure if you've been following the news lately, you've, uh, you've uh, already heard about all of this uh, discussion going on in Washington, D.C., uh, in which the government is figuring out how to stimulate the economy. And uh, we're, we're used to this kind of talk, so, so very few of us probably are startled to say, Stimulate the economy. I've never heard of the government doing that before. Uh, in fact, if you're if you're my age or younger, this is the kind of talk you've you've heard and seen in the the news for your entire life. But uh, but there was a time not not so long before my generation when 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 people would have been brought up short by that idea. They would have said, well, "What do you mean, government stimulate the economy? How how can the government stimulate the economy?" Uh, it wouldn't have made any sense to people once upon a time that, that government had uh, the knowledge or the ability to do any such thing. Uh, of course, whenever the government promises to hand out money, uh, a lot of people immediately favor the program. And this time, of course, they, they purport to have a program that's going to give all of us, uh, or nearly all of us, uh, uh, some money. So that uh, promises to get a lot of support, of course. But uh, uh, a, a friend of mine a few days ago likened this uh, stimulus program to, to the, uh, the idea that, that you're going to dip water out of the deep end of the swimming pool and dump it in the shallow end. And, uh, 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 <laughs> And you do this with the expectation that the water level is going to rise. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, now my, my old friend Walter Block has, has been defaming these Chicago economists. And, and uh, once upon a time, I, I taught for, for years at the University of Washington with many colleagues from the University of Washington. And, and so I want to say a kind word on their behalf. One of the things they used to always ask whenever we had a lecture or seminar on macroeconomics uh, that would often boil down to this kind of stimulus proposal at the end, uh, these Chicagoans would always say, where does the money come from? And it was an excellent question because if you ask that about these stimulus uh, proposals, where does the money come from, you immediately begin to see the fallacy of the idea that simply by spending money, even a large amount of money, the government can, can stimulate the economy. Now, now, some would say, of course, uh, your, your old-fashioned Keynesian would say, well, it's not really like this, uh, taking water out of the deep end of the pool and dumping it in the shallow because because, in fact, the, the government isn't going to take any money out. It's just going to dump money in because the, the, the government is going to not tax anybody anymore. It's going to pay for these, uh, these stimulus payments by increasing the government deficit. 
So it's not going to take anything away from you. In taxes, it's just going to borrow more money. And that won't cost you a dime, will it? <laughs> well, that's the idea behind Keynesian economics, that when the government runs a deficit, uh, uh, it, it can just create real income uh, out of thin air just by, by spending the money, which otherwise presumably would have would have been put in mattresses or, or never come into existence in the first place. Now, if you ask yourself, how is it that we, we came to be in this country a, a, a people who, who for several generations uh, have taken this stimulus talk for granted, uh, you, you could say, well, it, it's Keynes' fault. Uh, he wrote this book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in 1936, and he had all these bad ideas, and economists picked them up and, and made them the focus of uh, their study for decades thereafter, and, and while they were doing that, they spilled over onto journalists and uh, other opinion leaders, and, and they became sort of the common lore by which uh, politics is carried out in this country. Uh, but I don't think that's quite how it happened. Uh, not that that didn't occur. Uh, yes, the mainstream economists did absorb Keynesian ideas, and for, for several decades they were very influential in the economics profession. But <clears throat> I don't think that's how the general public uh, and the journalists and, and other opinion leaders really came to embrace this idea that the government can spend money, especially spend money while running a, a budget deficit, and somehow stimulate the economy, raise it from recession, uh, or uh, prevent it from going into recession, as they, they now pretend they're doing. Uh, I, I think, actually, the way people came to embrace this sort of thinking was, uh, uh, as is normal, uh, based on an interpretation of history. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, there, there is a, a fallacy uh, that war creates prosperity, and the reason in this country uh, so many people subscribe to that fallacy uh, is not because they've thought it through and realized that war creates death and destruction and waste of resources rather than creation of wealth. Uh, the reason they think that is that they, they, they've all been told, or if they're old enough, they recall that uh, for a decade or more in the 1930s, this country wallowed in a deep depression, the worst in its history, and that uh, eventually it came out of that. And what got it out? As the saying goes, the war got the economy out of the depression. And not only is that a belief that ordinary people subscribe to, uh, but to this day, most economists subscribe to that. Uh, when I started writing seriously about this topic uh, uh, almost 20 years ago, I, I, I started out by looking at what economic historians had to say about this episode of our history. And I went back and I found uh, in the first article I wrote on it about 12 or 13 citations from leading textbooks in economic history in which this sentence recurred almost verbatim. The war got the economy out of the depression. And, uh, and just a few years ago, uh, a book came out which uh, involved interviews with, with uh, a dozen or more leading economists. These are not just guys they found standing on the street corner looking for jobs. Uh, leading economists in the American profession uh, and the, uh, the editor uh, in interviewed all these people, and one of the things he asked them was, was uh, what got the e economy out of the Depression, and practically every one of them said the war got the economy out of the Depression. These are people that, that, in that included uh, several Nobel Prize winners, uh, 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 including Paul Samuelson and, and a number of uh, other people, in including Milton Friedman, uh, and Milton Friedman emphasized that it wasn't just government spending, but it was also the big increase in money supply that the Federal Reserve brought about during the war. But he basically, uh, with that proviso, agreed that the war uh, got the economy out of the Depression. Now, I've uh, 
I've been actually teaching for 30 years or more that, that that's wrong. That first of all, uh, the war didn't get the economy out of the depression, certainly not in the way people think, because they think uh, there was prosperity during the war. And what I've been trying to show people is that even if you accept all the standard forms of evidence that economists use to make their arguments, the evidence is not consistent with that idea. And there are many other problems. I'll touch upon some of them as I go along today, but uh, I've actually pulled together uh, some of my more important writings on this subject, and uh, those writings form the first half of, of a book Lou mentioned called Depression, War, and Cold War. Uh, it was uh, published last year. So uh, if you want to follow this and, and see some of the details and the historical evidence, uh, I invite you to, to have a look at that book, and, uh, uh, and I hope it will convince you that, uh, that uh, I'm not a crank, uh, as Walter, uh, Walter said, you know, we, uh, we, <laughs> we libertarians or Austrian economists are, are constantly having to fight the, uh, the indictment of being cranks and of not knowing what we're talking about. Uh, uh, I didn't start out as, a, uh, as an Austrian economist. I was trained in a mainstream uh, university, a very good one in the usual way, and I only came to my beliefs over a long period of time of examining them and holding them up against uh, what I learned from Austrians such as uh, Mises and Hayek and others over the years. So uh, uh, I think I do know what I'm talking about, and I think my book will attest to that, so I invite you to have a look at it. But today I want to just go through some of the, some of the uh, highlights of what happened uh, to convince people at the time. Now, here in the chart that I've put up is a very uh, long-term view of the, uh, of the growth of the U.S. economy. You can't see this very well, so I'll tell you what it shows. Uh, it, it really starts way back in uh, 1869 and, uh, and runs all the way up to the 1990s. Now, it's, it, it shows the real gross domestic product for the United States. Uh, and the, the, the remarkable things I want to call to your attention are these. First of all, uh, by and large, uh, this chart just shows steady, long-run growth. Okay? The American economy has been growing fairly rapidly uh, since actually the, the early part of the 19th century. Uh, and... Uh, most of the time, it grows not perfectly regularly, but with slight ups and downs, it continues to grow year after year. Uh, there are reasons for that having to do with the institutions that became established, such as reasonably uh, good private property rights, uh, uh, most of all. But uh, at all events, that, that's the, uh, uh, the long-run record. Now, you'll see that this is a record that extends right up to the present, basically, and, and in all of our history, there are only two large deviations. One is the big uh, negative deviation that uh, fills up the entire decade of the 1930s, where the economy dips uh, drastically below its trend line, uh, and, and then it recovers, and in this chart, it looks as if it's sometime in the early 40s, it's back on its trend line, uh, and then it shoots way above its trend line. Uh, and it has a big bulge uh, during the World War II years, uh, and then it falls back at the end of the war. And, and uh, if you didn't know about the Great Depression of 1946, you've all heard of that, right? The Great Depression of 1946? Well, you should have, because here it's plainly shown, right here on the chart, using the data that all mainstream economists rely on for their macroeconomic theorizing. That drop in real GDP from 1945 to 46 was the, the, the largest single year drop of income in American history. And that's why you've all heard about the great suffering of 1946 and the people who were dying in the streets and <laughs> And, of course, that was all caused by capitalism. So there's something wrong here, I suggest. There's something badly wrong. Now, 
this is a chart that shows the rate of unemployment in the American economy. Uh, and from 1890 to 1990, thank you, Walter. And uh, as you can see, the, the unemployment rate tends to be about 5% in our economy. Uh, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, and there have only been uh, two, two times in our history when it got substantially higher. Uh, one was in the 1890s when there was a, a, a period of several years of, of, uh, of depression, uh, but that ended uh, uh, by the 1897, 98 or thereabouts. Uh, but the other, the one that really stands out in the chart is, of course, in the 1930s when the unemployment rate rose uh, well above 20 percent, and according to the standard uh, figures, it, it, it be became as high as 25 percent in 1933. So unemployment rates were, were very high in the 1930s, and, and that's the principal thing that everybody thinks about when they think of the Great Depression. Uh, of, of course, real income fell drastically, and, 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 and many other measures of economic well-being uh, deteriorated during the 1930s, but the thing that really uh, struck hardest was this massive unemployment. Uh, and not only were, were uh, nearly a, a quarter of the workers without jobs uh, in the early 30s, but uh, probably a third of those who still had jobs were working uh, reduced hours and virtually everybody was living in fear of becoming unemployed, even if he wasn't at the moment. So it was a really uh, horrifying uh, episode in American history. Nothing had ever happened like that before, uh, and, and fortunately nothing like that has happened since. But it made a huge impact on people at the time who lived through it, and uh, even carried forward to their children into the next generation. It had many effects. I can't talk about all of them today, but uh, it, it, it has an effect you can still see to this day. Uh, if you look at people who, who came to maturity during the Great Depression, those people were marked for life. And it, they're very old people now, but you can see if you sample their attitudes about government involvement in the economy, that they are the, the cohort most favorable to government intervention. Uh, and it, this has much to do with their experience in the Great Depression. Now, before the 20th century, if you would said to somebody, well, war causes economic prosperity, they would have thought you were a lunatic. Uh, uh, people knew perfectly well that even though there may be some some uh, suppliers to the armies that make money from war, uh, and the undertakers do well, uh, that, that, that war is a destructive thing, that it saps resources, that it, that it, that it wastes resources, uh, that it's a horrifying thing economically as well as uh, personally. Uh, it, it, there's nothing good to be said about it unless you are a, a very special bloodsucker. Okay? Uh, if you are a merchant of death, Okay, then, then death is good for your business, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, war is a bad thing. It's only in the 20th century, uh, and, and particularly, it's only since World War II that any, in any serious way, this notion of wartime prosperity has, uh, has resonated with the American people and to some extent with people in other countries too. Uh, and the reason is because of this idea that the war got uh, the economy uh, out of the depression and, and to some extent it got other economies in Europe and elsewhere out of the depression as well. So uh, war, war has come to have this, this aura of being at least perhaps a good thing. And I've noticed in my life every time we're at the onset of a war, there's always a rash of articles in the, in the business press and elsewhere saying, you know, will this be good for business? You see that every time the U.S. goes to war, is this going to stimulate business? Is this going to help the economy? Is it going to drive down unemployment? Uh, and what we're seeing there is the, the grip that this fallacy has on people. 
Now again, uh, particularly for those of you in the back of the room, you may not be able to see uh, very clearly what's going on in this, uh, this chart, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call to your attention the uh, uh, certain outstanding features of it. If you look at the uh, civilian unemployment rate, which is uh, in the, the fourth column, uh, you see that uh, in fiscal year 1940, it was 15.7%. Uh, so e even after more than a decade of depression, the unemployment rate was very high. So obviously the New Deal had failed to get the economy out of the depression if after all of the improvement that it claimed to have brought about, we still had uh, almost 16% unemployment uh, according to the official measure of unemployment. Now, I will note that the official way of measuring unemployment counted uh, millions of people who were working in government emergency employment programs as unemployed. Uh, and if you, if you didn't do that, if instead you counted them as employed, then the unemployment rate would, would have been about five points less. But nonetheless, unemployment, uh, as the decade of the 40s began, was in the neighborhood of 10%. Now, what happened is that uh, after that, it fell very rapidly. And, and you can see that, that by 1943, it's, it's only 3%. And then for the next couple of years, it, it's only about 1%. And these are the lowest rates of unemployment ever uh, measured in American economic history. Uh, and anybody who knows uh, about the labor market during World War II can tell you that, in fact, there was no unemployment during the war. Anybody who wanted to work <laughs> could get a job almost immediately. And the only reason anybody was out of a job was because he was moving from one job to a better one. So there's no doubt that unemployment that disappeared as any kind of a problem whatsoever. And in fact, uh, employment was ample uh, during the war. Now, can we then conclude that it's true? The war got the economy out of the depression. Well, not exactly. That is, what we're seeing here is not the reduction of unemployment that w we would normally see in a business expansion. And the way to see that is to look at another column, uh, the, the third column, which is defense employment. Uh, and that shows the percent of the total labor force uh, that was in uh, defense-related employment, either in the armed forces uh, or civilian employees uh, of the armed forces or uh, uh, working in armed supply industries. Now, you'll see in, in, in fiscal 1940, less than 2% of the total labor force fell into that category. The, the armed forces were very small in 1940, only a few hundred thousand people in the Army and Navy together, a, a, a handful of people in the arms industries, a handful of people working for the War Department and the Navy Department. So they didn't amount to much, uh, not even 2% of the total labor force. but that figure rose very quickly starting in 1941, and you'll see that by the peak years of the war, for about four years, close to 40% of the American labor force was either in the armed forces, uh, and that's about half of that category, or in the armed supply industries or uh, civilians working for uh, the armed forces. So what we have is a huge drain of people uh, into military-related employment during the war. Now, one way they got them, of course, was simply to offer them uh, jobs. Uh, and so people would go take a job at the Pentagon as a secretary or, or somewhere else in a regular job uh, working in war-related activity. Uh, but, the, but what all of these people were doing was working in some capacity to support the actual armed forces. And the actual armed forces went from the few hundred thousand I mentioned a minute ago to more than 12 million men and women, almost all men, uh, by 1945. And how did that happen? It happened because more than 10 million men were drafted. And of the 
other six million who served at some time in the armed forces but had enlisted voluntarily many of them actually joined because they wanted to join before they got drafted if you waited to get drafted you might well find yourself in the infantry where life was going to be unpleasant at best and fatal at worst so uh, many men decided to 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 jump the gun as it were and join before they got drafted and stuck in the infantry so basically the armed forces during world war ii uh, despite all the the patriotic sentiment that existed at the time the armed forces were built up overwhelmingly uh, by coercion by forcing men uh, into the armed forces by giving them a choice of entering the armed forces or entering prison. Well, that's not normally how we reduce unemployment in this country. Eh? <laughs> and if you think, well, this was a good deal to get rid of unemployment, I think you need to ask, well, doesn't it depend on how we get rid of unemployment? If we get rid of unemployment by taking a lot of innocent men and and threatening them with violence and imprisonment if they don't do as they're told, that's not quite what we think of as a business cycle expansion. Now the remarkable thing you see when the war ends, the armed forces were disbanded very quickly. Uh, in the first year after the end of the war, uh, about 10 million of, or so of the 12 million then in uniform were released from service uh, and then uh, a few more in the, in the following year. So uh, the armed forces were drastically reduced in 1946 uh, and, and you see that in, in the figures here. Uh, by 1947 that defense related employment has fallen back to 5 percent from 40. So uh, this this was a, this was a, a a a drastic cutback in the thing that had reduced the unemployment. But look what happens to the official rate of unemployment in the next column. It, it only goes up to 3.8 percent maximum. Yeah. Nowadays, 3.8 percent would be regarded as superheated economy, right? But in this Great Depression of 1946. <laughs> Unemployment never got above 4%. That's because, of course, there was no Great Depression. Uh, what there was was a, just a cutback in defense, uh, employment, and production. So let's go next to that and have a look. In, in this chart, uh, we have uh, several different measures of military output as a percent of gross national product uh, in the 1940s. And what you see is that military output was a trivial part of the American economy's production before the war, 1% or so, 1% to 2%. Rose very rapidly uh, during the early years of the war and then leveled off at approximately 40% or more of, of uh, total output uh, during the peak years of the war. So uh, the economy was uh, very, very heavily focused on military production uh, dur during those years. And uh, that's what produced that big bulge you saw in my first chart, what threw the economy so far above its trend line. Uh, the question we have to ask is what does it mean? What does this production mean? Uh, how do we evaluate it? Uh, when, the, when it was put into gross national or gross domestic product by the accountants, uh, they thought it meant something straightforward. They thought they could put in the value of B-29s just the way they put in the value uh, of, of breakfast cereal. But uh, the value of breakfast cereal is basically the product of the number of boxes sold times the price per box, and that price is the result of demand and supply interacting in markets where people are free to buy breakfast cereal or not. 
The price of B-29s was arrived at in a completely different way. The B-29s were uh, priced in negotiations between a War Department buyer and uh, some guys from the Boeing company uh, who sat down and decided what price they would, they would set on the, on the airplanes. Uh, and when the payments were made for the airplanes, they were made with money which had been taken by force from the American people. So what are we to make of the price of a B-29? What does it mean? If we say a box of breakfast cereal cost 50 cents in 1944, and a B-29 costs uh, cost, uh, $150,000, you know, prices were low then, uh, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that you know, one was worth you know, three, 300,000 times more than the other? Well, no, it, it, we have no way to know what it means. In fact, it doesn't mean anything because there's no economic process that generates the pricing of these, these war products. They're just arbitrary. And so if you put this kind of product pricing into the measure of gross national or gross domestic product, you're throwing noise in there. You don't know what it means. Uh, at least in the ordinary cases, you have some anchor. You have the anchor of market pricing to keep you from going totally astray in the valuation you attach to different forms of, uh, of goods and services the economy generates. In the case of these war products, you don't have anything like that. But the point here is that during the war, this so-called so, so war prosperity consists entirely of war production. This is another way to view it. Uh, here we've got the government purchases uh, measured with the dark bars and the private investment measured uh, in the light bars and uh, it runs from 1929 to 1950. And, and of course you can see here the, the big fall in private investment during the Great Depression uh, and then some recovery later. But notice there's another big fall in private investment during the war. At the same time that government spending is skyrocketing. And in fact, during the war, government spending was skyrocketing not only to pay the uh, wages of uh, men in the armed forces, uh, but it was taking over investment. Uh, one of the chapters in my book uh, is called The Socialization of Investment During World War II, and it has to do with the fact that Almost all the investment during the war was made either directly by the government or under some kind of government subsidy and arrangement. In fact, during the war, you couldn't really make any kind of investment at all uh, without government's approval because just getting raw materials required an allocation of materials from the government. Uh, you couldn't build a, a new house for yourself, for example, because uh, you, you wouldn't be allowed to purchase the lumber to do that during, during the war. So all the materials were being directed to war purposes uh, for about four years at that time. So the government spending went up enormously uh, for everything connected with the war, uh, but private investment plummeted. This is one of my favorite charts I've ever drawn. Uh, it shows a lot of things. Uh, one is that uh, it shows at, at the top with that solid line, uh, that's the standard kind of measure of gross domestic product. You see the big drop during the Depression and then the great bulge during the war. And I've fitted a trend line uh, to that to, to connect the values for 1929 uh, with the next year of comparable prosperity in 1948. So you can see the economy operating way below trend throughout the, uh, the 30s and, and, and into the beginning of the 40s, and then operating way above trend. Now anybody who, who had looked at these data should have already smelled a rat, uh, because uh, these trend lines uh, constructed in this way, where you connect the values of two prosperous years, uh, 
are like measures of the economy's capacity to produce. The economist says, well, the economy had the resources uh, to have grown along that trend line. So instead of getting from 1929 to 48 by first dipping and then jumping up and then falling back, it could have simply grown smoothly along that trend line. It had the labor and capital and other resources necessary to do that. Uh, and it, unfortunately, it suffered these deviations from trend. But if that's a capacity trend line, how do you produce more than your capacity? How do you go way above trend if that's a capacity line? And the answer is, well, it doesn't make sense. And the reason you, you do that on these charts is because of the accounting problems I was just describing. This war output wasn't real output. It was arbitrary numbers. It looks uh, in the data as if it means something, but it doesn't. It's uh, just nonsense. Now, an important thing is to look at the bars at the bottom, these uh, black bars, because they measure the private part of gross domestic product. Now, during the 1930s, you see that looks very much like the line above it. There's the big drop between 1929 and 33, and there's some recovery, and then there's a depression of 37, 38, and some more recovery. But, but what you see is that, that uh, even in 1940, 41, uh, when the economy has recovered uh, quite a bit, it's still far below its trend line. The economy in 1941 it has not recovered fully at all. If it had grown smoothly, as it was capable of doing, as we know from the trend I've connected between 29 and 48, it could have been much higher than it was in 1941. So private output had not recovered. And then, to make things worse, it began to fall. Many of the writers about uh, World War II like to say that the great thing about it was we had guns and butter. Okay? We didn't have to bear any opportunity cost when we, when we produced all these B-29s and Sherman tanks. But that isn't true. And you see that when you look at the private part of gross domestic product. It dropped substantially, and it stayed down at a low level until the war was almost over. Even in 1945, the private part of gross domestic product was lower than it had been in 1941 at which time, as I said, it was still uh, representative of a subpar economy, a depressed economy. So the economy hadn't fully recovered before the war started. Then the, the meaningful part of it sank even lower. And it was only, only during that glorious year, 1946, when the war ended, most of the men were released from the armed forces. Uh, most of the controls on raw materials, prices, and other aspects of the economy were <clears throat> removed. Only in that year did the private economy rebound, and it rebounded enormously. A minimum estimate of the growth in 1946 is 30% in one year. 30% in a single year. There was never a year like that in our history. Ever. Not even half that good, ever. 30% in one year. And what that shows is real. And that's why that first chart I showed you that shows the Great Depression of 46 is not just spurious, not just nonsense, but it's nonsense in spades. What looks like the second worst year in American history from the standard GDP data was in reality the best year ever in year-to-year -year performance of all time. This was the real peace dividend. The real peace dividend. And after that, the economy began to perform much better, and it continued to perform much better from that time forward because it never had to endure this kind of wrenching deprivation that it occurred during World War II when the government sucked nearly half of the resources out of it for war purposes. Hmm? 
Some of my fellow economists who've uh, argued with me over the years about this uh, argue most strongly with regard to what happened to consumption during the war. They say, yeah, it's true that the government did a lot of things, produced a lot of military output, but nonetheless, American consumers were better off during the war than they had been before. And if you look at, again, the standard data that economists use, uh, I've made those into an index number in the, in the second column there, uh, they do look as if uh, they, they get bigger during the war. Looks as if uh, uh, personal consumption per capita actually is, is growing uh, during the war. Uh, not much, but okay, they seem to have a case there. Unfortunately, that case is bogus too. Uh, unfortunately for them, and uh, unfortunately for me, I didn't bring the chart that, uh, that, <laughs> that wraps this up. So let me tell you what is going on here. Uh, during the war, uh, there, were, there were price controls over nearly everything in the civilian economy. You, you didn't need price controls over the military output because that was already being set by the military authorities, as I explained. But nearly all civilian goods and services were subject to price controls, whether it was rents or the price of shirts or shoes or, or beef steaks, you name it. Uh, uh, practically everything had a, had a maximum price that you could charge by law. Uh, a number of important goods, uh, because uh, when their prices were controlled, they became uh, very scarce, uh, were rationed. So that if you went to, to, to buy a pair of shoes, or you went to buy a gallon of gasoline, you had to not only pay the, the official price, uh, but you also had to have a ration coupons uh, of a stipulated amount. So there was a kind of two price system. Uh, I've actually brought a ration book with me today because I, I intend to be prepared uh, uh, in, in case our, <clears throat> our masters decide once again to, uh, to reimpose this system on us. But, uh, but uh, th this made life even more difficult for consumers because it meant that because the, the goods were, were priced below market values, the sellers were not eager to, to sell them in great uh, abundance. And so people would have to troop around looking for somebody willing to sell them the goods they wanted at the controlled price uh, uh, with their coupons, uh, which the government you know, said it, it was unlawful to sell. Uh, naturally, of course, there was a, a thriving black market, and people commonly gave these things to their friends and relatives when they didn't need them at the moment, because it, every month you had to go to the ration board and get a fresh supply. And every living human being had to have a booklet. Uh, the one I hold in my hand was issued to a two-year-old child. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this was how wonderful life was during the war. And uh, these price controls completely distort the official data. Uh, we don't really know what the values of goods were because of these controls. The official prices are obviously not, not meaningful ones. Uh, we can try to estimate, and a number of economists have tried to estimate, uh, how much higher actual prices were than, than the control prices and to, to make adjustments for the measured rate of inflation. Uh, probably the best uh, estimate, and I still think it's insufficient for various reasons uh, explained in my book, was one that uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz made uh, in the 1980s, uh, based on very careful statistical work, but nonetheless it, it, it has deficiencies, which I, I, I know they will own up to. But I know that because Anna has endorsed my work. <laughs> so, so uh, Milton, uh, I can't, I can't get his endorsement today, but, uh, but I think Milton was starting to come around too, actually, from what people have told me uh, before he died, uh, and I know Anna has. So, uh, if you adjust for the mismeasurement of the rate of inflation during the war, what you find is that the, the real value of uh, consumer output was was much lower than the official numbers would have you believe. Uh, that is, consumers were not better off during the war. They were not holding their own during the war. They were, in fact, getting worse off. Uh, many goods, of course, weren't available at all at any price. Uh, 
in the beginning months of 1942, the government simply ordered the automobile industry to shut down production of civilian automobiles, and it did. So they weren't available again uh, in, in substantial numbers until starting in 1946. So no new cars. Used cars, of course, were hard to come by because everybody was trying to get hold of one, uh, there being no new ones available. Uh, uh, consumer appliances, uh, things like stoves for your kitchen, uh, practically any appliance made with steel was either not available at all or available in very, very limited quantities. Uh, uh, as I said, people had to to spend a lot more time and effort just finding the goods they, they wanted to buy. And these uh, jobs they held uh, in order to buy goods during the war often required that they move long distances to centers of defense production where they could get these jobs. And when they got there, they found that the housing was very hard to get. They often ended up doubling or tripling up with other people living in very cramped quarters uh, living in tents or shanties or some such housing uh, in, in places where defense production was concentrated. So housing really deteriorated during the war. Rent controls removed the incentive for landlords to maintain properties, and so they almost gave up maintenance, which meant that the housing deteriorated steadily during the war, which, by the way, the entire capital stock of the American economy did as well. Because one reason for this miracle of production, in the sense that they did produce a lot of guns and ammunition, without doubt, one reason is that they did it by using up uh, capital. Uh, they did not do the usual maintenance and repairs on factories and other equipment. They, they ran uh, shifts two and three a day instead of one. Uh, and so they simply ate up the capital stock, which is one of the great lessons that uh, Ludwig von Mises taught about war economy, that it results in the destruction of capital. They, they gloried in the fact that the government was building new additions to capital, new factories, uh, shipyards, uh, airplane plants, and so forth. But if you look at what was built and then look at what it was worth after the war was over, you find that it had very little value in most cases. So this offset that uh, many economists think the government was making uh, to offset using up the old capital stock is mostly bogus as well. This doesn't say that the factories didn't produce tanks and airplanes and so forth. They did. But if you ask what was that worth to consumers, uh, the answer in a sense is nothing. Uh, it was valuable because it helped the country win the war. That was its only value in most cases. So. Even World War II, the classic case that convinced all Americans that the war got the economy out of the Depression, that government can use huge deficits to stimulate the economy, the whole episode is bogus. It's historically bogus, it's economically bogus, and it's been a terribly destructive myth and fallacy to this very day. Thank you very much.